As a volunteer historical interpreter, I get asked some interesting questions, mainly about general hygiene practices in the 19th century. It's easy for us to think that because they didn't have indoor plumbing and some of the luxuries we do today, that they were lacking in general personal care. When you read from periodicals, newspapers, and books of the time, you find they really had a lot to say about hygiene. It's not really any different from today. Open any magazine at the grocery store check stand and you will have someone selling you everything from toothpaste to body wash to shampoo. Articles telling you how to use it and what you should do. You'd think after all these years of humanity, we'd have perfected all types of hygiene, but clearly we have not. One thing I love about researching is the oddities that you trip across. As I was researching this topic, one area stood out, so I'm going to start with that today. It comes with some strange stories and a really good myth. What is it? It's dental care. I was fascinated by the fact that some of the things we think of as modern technology are only improvements on practices from well over 200 years ago. And I was a little caught off guard by some of the things they thought of as acceptable practices. And I'm sure you will be too. The ADA, American Dental Association, can trace oral care by writings found in Sumeria about 5000 BC. At that time, they thought that tooth decay was caused by tooth worms. Nice. Fast forward a few thousand years and what the Sumerians probably thought were tooth worms were actually tooth roots, but they were at least thinking about the causality of tooth decay and likely understanding that it played an important role in good health. For today, I'm going to stay mainly within the confines of the 18th and 19th centuries. Some great advancements took place at that time. In 1840, the first dental college opened and nearly 20 years later, the American Dental Association was formed. By the close of the 19th century, we start seeing dentistry recognized as a true profession with more regulation and standardized practices, much like today. Dental care has been deemed important for centuries. Cleanliness of teeth is to the eye what purity of breath is to the sense of smelling. But most importantly, health depends in great measure on good, sound, and clean teeth. Good in order to perfect mastication of food, sound that they may not impregnate the alimentary substances with a vitiated and unwholesome juice. That's a mouthful. In other words, to be able to chew well and not have foul breath, which comes from rotting teeth. Many of us have seen old westerns where someone in town has a toothache and they go to the local barber, yes, the person that cuts hair, to have their tooth pulled. It seems ridiculous. But back in the early 1800s, the barber was responsible for most surgical procedures. The country doc would give you tinctures and potions, but the barber surgeon did the heavy work. In the 1700s and into the 1800s, doctors were not permitted to actually perform surgeries. You went to the barber surgeon for having boils lanced, bloodletting, cupping, dental care, and of course, a number two off the back. Did you know what the red, white, and blue colors on a barber pole mean? The red stood for blood, the white for bandages, and the blue for veins. It was to indicate that they were barber surgeons who did bloodletting. What did it cost for dental work? In Boston, Massachusetts in 1838, pulling a single pivot tooth was $2.00. Fillings were a dollar and extractions were 25 cents. The average worker at that time made about $26 per month, depending on their line of work. We know that dental hygiene was important to the Victorians because it's mentioned frequently in their publications. Did they brush their teeth? Well, yes and no. Brushing as we do it today was not always executed the exact same back then. I think it's more accurately called teeth cleaning because not everyone used a toothbrush as we do today. So what did they use? Chewing sticks, sponges, wool cloth, and toothbrushes, or just lots of rinsing throughout the day with plain water. The chewing stick dates back thousands of years. Basically, they would take a stick and chew up one end until it became frayed. That end would be used for cleaning your teeth and gums. The other end of the stick was often cut into a fine point to use as a toothpick. The main downside to these sticks was that it was hard to get into the crevices of the tooth. Today, in some third world countries, these chewing sticks are still being used. They also use toothpicks made of silver or gold, and sometimes some jewel-encrusted ones. They thought picking one's teeth was good for getting out the food particles. 
These picks look more like dental instruments than our wooden ones today. In an article in 1831, the author claimed metal picks far too injurious to the tooth enamel and gums. I think today you'd be hard pressed to find a dentist that recommends a metal pick of any kind. Toothbrushes. Some felt bone handled boar haired toothbrushes were much too injurious to the teeth and gum. They are very similar to our modern toothbrushes with the exception of being stiff boar hair bristles versus soft nylon ones. They make reproductions of this type of toothbrush and, I, and I've used them. It's rough on your gums. The bristles are really long, which also make it difficult to fit in your mouth. But it does give you a really good idea of what the Victorians faced when they were brushing their teeth. So I think in some of the articles that I read where they said to brush your teeth very gently, I think this is what they were referred to because it would take you several months of use to make a boar hair bristle soften enough. And until it did, your gums would pay the price. Here's a tidbit of trivia for you. The first toothbrush ever made came out of China in the year 1498, and it was made from wood. Sponges, think sea sponge, not cello sponges like what you use in your kitchen, or cloths were also used. The sponges were used either by themselves, just cut into small pieces with a little bit of type of toothpaste or cleaner on it and rubbed around the mouth, or some of them were also mounted on sticks or metal um, brush handles. Uh, cloths were also made of either cotton or wool, and it was just simply a piece of cloth, almost like your washcloth today that you could just rub your teeth in your mouth. They were gentler on the gums, but unfortunately, they weren't very good at cleaning the crevices of the teeth well enough. That's why they've never won out over toothbrushes in the dental world. I'm sure in a pinch, these would help at least a little bit. Today, some hospitals still use sponges for ICU patients who can't brush their teeth. You can also purchase them as a disposable travel alternative, although they still are not as effective as toothbrushes, so your mileage may vary. Whether you prefer brushing, sponging, or rinsing, they recommend at least twice a day, morning and night, but many recommended rinsing and br or brushing after every meal. Does that sound familiar? The Victorians knew that all acidic food, drink, medicine, and tooth washes and powders are very injurious to the teeth. If a tooth is put in cider vinegar, lemon juice, or tartaric acid, in a few hours, the enamel will be completely destroyed. Refined sugar from either cane or beet is injurious to the teeth, either by immediate contact with these organs or by the gas developed while it's in the stomach. Okay, maybe not that last little bit, but they were on the right track. Still today, dentists agree, sugar is not good for your teeth. They use dentrifices, aka toothpaste, with their chosen method of dental cleaning. Dentrifice is the French word for toothpaste. It includes powders and paste. The term pretty much disappears in the late 19th and early 20th century after toothpaste tube was invented and powders fell in popularity. What's in toothpaste? It's a combination of abrasives and surfactants. Abrasives aid in scrubbing the food debris and tartar from the teeth. Today, we use things like sodium bicarbonate or baking soda, aluminum hydroxide, calcium carbonate, calcium phosphate, and silicas. In the 19th century, those abrasives included things like ground pumice stone, cuttlefish bones, and oyster shells. First, pumice stone is what we use to clean porcelain toilets today. It removes mineral stains. I'm sure it got the stains off your teeth, but you may not have your teeth for very long. It's very rough and gritty. Cuttlefish bones are what we put in bird cages for them to clean and sharpen their beaks. Oyster shell is high in calcium, but also very hard. All of these substances, even finely ground, would basically give you a nice sandpaper for your teeth. One recipe even calls for adding Peruvian bark to oyster shell. Peruvian bark is used to make quinine for malaria, and it also has the effect of being anti-inflammatory and fever reducing. It was probably helpful for swollen gums, but probably not one of the best toothpaste you could use. Surfactants are the soapy part that makes the toothpaste foamy, which is important for evenly distributing the abrasives and other components in your toothpaste, like fluoride. In the 19th century, this com combination of abrasive and surfactant was not really a consideration. It wasn't until 1824 a dentist named Peabody was the first person to actually add soap or surfactant to toothpaste, but it hadn't caught on widely yet. Instead, they like to use for all forms of essential oils, vinegars, and spirits, think alcohol again, to create a tooth cleanser. There are even recipes that require spirit of vitrol, which is sulfuric acid. However, 
one of my favorites listed in Godey's Ladies Book in 1834, was a recipe for giving firmness to soft gums. Keep in mind, soft gums mean gingivitis. Gingivitis is when your gums are swollen, red, and irritated because of built-up plaque. So this was their cure. Take Spanish wine and distilled water of bramble leaves, add to it one half ounce of cinnamon, cloves, and orange peel, cook it, and then bottle it. But if you want it to be more effective, you add the liquor of a half point pint of cinnamon water distilled in white wine. Now alcohol and cinnamon are hot. Now imagine that on tender gums. Do you always work to get whiter teeth? The Victorians did too. You'll never guess what they used. Yep, charcoal. The same thing found in most whitening toothpaste today. Flossing also wasn't as widely practiced back then. In fact, it wasn't called that until later in the 19th century. It was referred to as passing a thread between the teeth to clean them more. It's traced back to 1815 when they used silk thread for this very purpose. How did they deal with bad breath? They mainly mixed strong herbs like mint, thyme, lemon thyme, cloves, and nutmeg, mixed with spirits of alcohol of any kind. Let it stand for a few days and strain off the tincture. Add 10 drops of peppermint oil and you are ready to go. Listerine was made in 1879 by Joseph Lister. In the beginning, it was not marketed as an antiseptic mouthwash like it is today. It was said to have been sold as a surgical disinfectant, a cure for dandruff, floor cleaner, hair tonic, deodorant, and as a beneficial remedy for diseases ranging from diphtheria and dysentery to smallpox and gonorrhea. It wasn't until the early 20th century when Gerald Lambert took over the company, and it was his colorful advertisements that coined the medical condition halitosis, and it's all related to, and all of its related social fears that made Listerine what it is today. What did the Victorians do if they got a cavity? They started with home remedies, of course. They used opiates, cocaine, spirit of wine, camphor, and essential aromatic oils. All of these are applied to the affected tooth to act as to destroy the irritability of the nerves. When these fail, blistering behind the ear is an option, destroying the tooth nerve by a cautious use of strong acids, or, get ready, by a red hot wire frequently applied to the part, all have been attended with advantage. They also took the extract of belladonna, put it into a pill, which they let dissolve on the affected tooth. Belladonna is highly toxic and especially not safe when taken orally. If your first pain relief home remedy failed and you had a cavity that needed to be filled, there were several options available to you. But again, you started at home. Fillings could be done at home using tin, lead, or gold leaf. They were known to give relief for many months or even years. They also used a product called gutta percha. Gutta percha is a natural product from the Palaquium gutta plant. When the leaves are crushed, the product extracted makes a type of natural latex. People would take a lump of gutta percha, drop it into boiling water until it was soft. Then they would press it into their tooth, hold it in the mouth with cold water until it then hardened. It was said to last about as long as other fillings. Well, at least for a few months. If you instead had the option or decided to go to the dentist or barber to have your tooth pulled, it was nothing like today. No pain relievers were administered. The surgeons simply used their new and improved tooth extractor. Either a pair of forceps to pull the tooth, or they had a device that went around the tooth and basically twisted it out. Oftentimes, the tool resulted in the tooth shattering and then needing to be removed piece by piece, which was a very painful process. What happened if you lost all your teeth? They had dentures and dental bridges back then too. Both of these are used, still used today in modern dentistry and began in the sixth century. It's been around a while, folks. The most skilled manufacturers of dental prosthetics were the Etruscans. They did a fantastic line in gold bridge work. Depending on the size of the gap, they made a series of gold hoops. The outer ones fitted around the nearest sound teeth and the rest were filled with artificial teeth carved from ivory or bone and riveted into place with a gold pin. These not only looked impressive, they were secure enough to eat with. Have you ever heard that George Washington, our first United States president, had dentures made of wood? That was a popular myth when I was a kid. It really is a myth. George had terrible teeth and began losing them back when he was in his 20s. 
At age 24, Washington recorded in his diary that he paid five shillings to a Dr. Watson who removed one of his teeth. Letters and diary entries later in his life make regular reference to aching teeth, lost teeth, inflamed gums, ill-fitting dentures, and a host of other dental miseries. Payments to dentists and purchase of toothbrushes, teeth scrapers, denture files, he did some home fixes, toothache medication, and cleaning solutions are also regularly present in Washington's communications throughout his life. By the time he was inaugurated as president in 1889, he had only one of his own original teeth left. At that time, dentures were made from hippo ivory or ox bone. They used the ivory to make the main denture plate and then inserted more ivory teeth or ox bone made teeth. They connected the top plate to the bottom with strong springs made of steel. They looked downright painful. Washington's false teeth were made of ivory bone, a few from his own previously pulled teeth, and in later sets, Waterloo teeth. I'll get to those in just a second. Washington had several sets because they didn't last him very long. The reason they looked like wood was because ivory and bone do not have enamel on the exterior, so teeth stained really easily and rotted, giving the wearer bad breath to deal with. In one of Washington's correspondences with his dentist, his dentist suggested he lay off red wine because his dentures were being far too stained. Now on to Waterloo teeth. These are a strange and dark bit of history. Back in the 18th and 19th centuries, it was hard to come up with good looking teeth for dentures. Ivory had its limitations as we just discussed, so dentists would offer money to people to sell their teeth to make dentures. There were not a lot of takers. Most people wanted to keep their teeth. Demand was high, supply was low, so the cost for a set of dentures was very expensive. It cost about $37 in that time, or in today's money, about $3,142. But remember, $37 is more than a month's pay from back then. There was a profession that developed out of this need. We're going to call it a profession for lack of a better term. But they were called teeth snatchers. Sounds like something out of a horror movie, doesn't it? Fact is a lot freakier than fiction most days. These fellows would be paid by dentists to harvest the good teeth out of dead people. In 1815, when the Battle of Waterloo happened in France, tens of thousands of men were left dead. The teeth snatchers arrived from England, joined by some of the locals and some of the surviving soldiers and began their work. They had so many teeth that they had to be shipped back to England in barrels. Once in England, they were boiled, and that was their sterilization method, and sorted and set into ivory plates for dentures. Molars were generally not used because they were hard to pull and difficult for dentists to use. Toothless people wore their dentures with pride, likely never knowing they came from dead people. Waterloo supplied so many teeth that they were sent all over Europe and to the Americas. In 1856, this guy named Goodyear figured out how to vulcanize rubber. They then began using vulcanized rubber for the base of denture plates. The rubber could be colored pink to give the dentures a much more natural look. The Victorians knew, as we do today, that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, although unfortunately much of their cure was potentially very harmful, if not deadly. Speaking of deadly, do you know when the first recorded incident of using dental forensics to identify a body was? In 1768 and 1770, Paul Revere placed advertisements in a Boston newspaper offering his services as a dentist. He was a silversmith by trade after all, so this kind of lines up. But in 1776, in the first known case of postmortem dental forensics, Revere verifies the death of his friend, Dr. Joseph Warren, in the Battle of Breed's Hill, when he identifies the bridge that he constructed for Warren. Well, I'm sure that's enough dental stories for you today. I hope you learned a little bit about the history of dentistry and how it's evolved over the decades and centuries. This lesson hasn't made you thankful to live in the 21st century or encourage you to take care of your teeth and see your dentist. I don't know what will. Seriously, no idea. <laughs>